Oh, it's good to see everybody here today. I'll tell you, we're blessed to be able to meet together at the here of Christ. I'm particularly blessed because on Sundays, this will be now my third message. Some people ask me, so we can preach the same one every time? No. The Lord is blessed for me to be able to preach this glorious gospel. First makes it a blessing in my own heart. Blessing to his people as they hear. So let's rejoice together. Whatever is going on out there in this world, let's put a do not disturb sign on it. Whatever is going on in his heart, the Spirit of God, please just uh, shut the lights out on that and have uh, one light, which is Christ, as we hear his word. So Bob's going to come read for us this morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 53. The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done an abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did see God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. They were they in great fear, where no fear was. For God scattereth the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame, because God hath despised them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion, when God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. My gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, as Ken said, that we can come aside, that you would draw us here, dear Lord, put aside the cares of this world, dear Lord, to seek our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would open our eyes to see, ears to hear the word, and proclaim our righteousness, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we'll sing this to the tune of I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Behold the throne of grace, His promise mounts us near. There Jesus shows his lonely face and lives to hear our prayer. That rich redeeming blood, which at the cross we see, demands for sinners on to God and all sufficient plea. Thy mercy, Lord, bestow, thy presence and thy love. We ask to serve thee here below, and bring with thee above. Abiding in thy faith, our will conform to thine. Let us victorious be in death, and then in glory shine. All right, Robert's going to come and read for us the reading of the Lord's Word, 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has forgotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, Reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perish, though it be tried, the fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently to prophesy of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the form of lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was our ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, and the unpinched love, or true love, of his brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is a grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Father, we come before you now, and you are so worthy of being praised. Lord, I feel an to even read your word, because that sin nature is still within me. Lord, we came in this world spiritually dead. We ask you to awaken our souls that we may hear the voice of Christ today and through the preaching of the gospel. Lord, we pray that you be with Brother Ken and be with each and every one of us today and those that are hearing outside this congregation. Lord, we, we pray that you Give us, and that we would only keep our eyes on Christ. In those name we pray. Amen. That's such a great reading, both of them. Lesson. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 334. We'll stand and sing this together. Be Thou My Vision. 334. <laughs>
someone asks you if you believe in visions, you can let them know I have but one vision. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the wisdom, and the righteousness, and all that he is to the Father. Bless him. All right, well, let's take our Bibles and turn together to Exodus chapter 12. I'll put in there verses 1 to 10 really like to go all the way to verse 13, if possible, with the entire story. But I want to speak with you about the Passover lamb. I think of lambs as being so gentle, and yet this is what God's purpose should be, the picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. In many ways, he resembled a lamb that he had no guile in him. I've often said that the Lord didn't make lambs with horns. They're in and of themselves very timid, if you will, and that pictures the meekness even of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even more so, as Isaiah declared in Isaiah 53, that he was as before his shears dumped, he opened not his mouth. There was that very, you read in books, they call it the passive obedience of Christ in the sense that he didn't react when it came time to lay down his life. But I see that just as active as it was when he was living his life in perfect obedience to his father. He purposed that he should lay down his life and that sinners such as we are might be saved. So we see this depicted here all the way back in the Old Testament. In fact, you can go all the way back to the fall, where in light of Adam's sin, God took off their fig leaves and killed innocent animals. It doesn't say exactly what type, but I would presume, according to what we read in Scripture, it would have been some lambs. These would have been the very first sacrifices offered by God himself. It wasn't even Adam and Eve. It says God took and slew those animals and then clothed them in those animal skins. That's a picture of Christ's death and being clothed in that righteousness that he came to establish and earn whereby God could look upon such as Adam and Eve and declare them righteous. Well, the question is always asked, well, do you think Adam and Eve were saved? Well, if God shed the blood for them, they were, because he himself testifies to that. It's not how we are and how we behave, and this is how we're going to present ourselves. No. The fact that he slew the animal without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. This is God doing it. And then clothing them with those animal skins, representative of God's righteousness, that was their salvation. People will argue and say, well, look what he did, you know. Well, is any of us different? Is anyone of us any less uh, sinner than, than they were? But it's through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, years later, when it comes time to deliver Israel out of Egypt, that the Lord once again gives us this illustration, this example, how it is that he delivers any sinner. I've often said if God gives one declaration, it's sufficient. We believe it, rest in it. But all throughout Scripture, here it is again, a powerful testimony that God will give ears to hear of how it is that he saves sinners. And it's going to be through the blood sacrifice. So here, let me read this portion for us. 
down to verse 13, and then make some comments. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and he shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, or its boil, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, that which remaineth of it until the morning, he shall burn with fire. No leftovers. And thus shall ye eat with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, little G-O-D-S, of Egypt, I will execute judgment on the Lord. Then the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Let's sneak in verse 14. And this day shall be unto you what? For a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So, as we see, the Lord, have seen the past messages, the Lord had sent these various plagues against Egypt. Each one actually going up against one of their gods. And in the death of the firstborn, you say, well, how would that be going up against one of Egypt's gods? Well, Pharaoh himself was considered a god, little G-O-D. And so all of these plagues against the rivers and bringing out the flies and the lice and everything, that was God showing his power over anything that men could consider God. But now, we come to the pinnacle of Pharaoh himself, and there was none that was more considered by those of Egypt than the son of Pharaoh, because he was heir to the throne. This was their God. In fact, we have some today in the world that consider these men as gods, and look at them as gods. And now, the Lord having hardened, just like he did each time with those other plagues, the nine others, now we find that Pharaoh's heart is going to be particularly hardened, that he would not, even in this, let the children of Israel go until the Lord himself purposed it. We read over in Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. This is the ultimate judgment that we already considered last time, chapter 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh, and upon Egypt, and afterwards he will let you go hence. Why do you suppose God purposed that then he would let them go? Well, 
Well, because in this Passover lamb that was slain to preserve the firstborn of the children of Israel, this is a picture of how God delivers each of his chosen ones from the hand of evil, which Pharaoh represents, whether it's Satan, whether it's the world, whether it's the sin, that once that blood is shed, then there remains no other offering, nothing more to be done. That's why it says, and afterwards he will let you go hence. There was a bigger picture here than just, oh, Pharaoh's son died, so now he's given up. No. God purposed it. All the way up to this, God purposed that they remain in bondage and, and remain in that Egypt remain in harvest. But here, with the shed blood of the Passover lamb, he will let you go. And he shall surely notice, thrust you out, and so was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ effectual or not? When Christ laid down his life, was that the deliverance then that God required for saving sinners such as we are? Absolutely. This is, we're talking about the, this is in type of uh, Passover lamb. We're talking about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God being satisfied, uh, everyone for whom he paid the debt would be delivered. And wherein that blood was not put to the doorpost, they suffered the consequence. Whether Egypt, whether the, the beasts, even the beasts, because that's all part of the curse of the fall. And so, just the fact that the Lord, this wasn't a fight between Pharaoh and the Lord. This wasn't arm wrestling or tug of war to see who would win. The Lord already turned to the end from the beginning. He himself declared it here. Then will he let you go. And so the Passover lamb is a special type of the Lord Jesus Christ. For, for me, perhaps one of the clearest and most complete of all the types and pictures. You say, why are there so many types and pictures throughout the Old Testament? Well, no one could ever declare the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you ask me what one type or picture most fully reveals the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, I'd have to say, will it be the Passover lamb. Because in this, our Lord God preached, even to that Jewish nation, the whole truth, the doctrine of the gospel. First of all, in the choice of the sacrifice. They weren't left up to them Go find something. Oh, there's a bunch of rats in Egypt, so let's go grab some rats and kill them and slay them. That's blood. No. Nope. He himself specified here in Exodus chapter 12 that it be, as it says in verse 5, a lamb without blemish, a male of the first years. Very specific. Why? Because it all pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. A male, not a female but a male, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. A lot of people are concerned with why among the goats. Well, it, it represents really who we are by nature. And I believe in both of those, we have even a picture of Christ, the lamb being the meek and the humble, the goat being the strong. But both together in the sacrifice depict who the Lord Jesus Christ would be as that lamb. And so, in John chapter 1, and verse 29, if you look there with me, that's why John the Baptist's message was specific. He didn't say, behold, one of the lambs of God, because there have been thousands from the time that God first slew those innocent animals, and Abel offered a lamb, a sacrifice, all the way to the coming of Christ. It was the lamb. You see that in John 1 and verse 29? The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. Whatever had been sacrificed up to that point in time now here is the Lamb. This is what it's all about. This is who it's all about. Which taketh away the sin, notice it's singular, of the world. That sense there taketh away, it's bearing away. 
the sin of the world. A lot of people read that world and say, there you go, he's taken away everybody's sin. No, sin of the world in an ethnic sense, that wherever those sinners are throughout the world, that God has purposed to say, here is the sin bearer. This is Christ, even now being the sin bearer, first of all, in working out the righteousness required. It had to be a lamb without blemish. And so even here, now before the cross, he's bearing away the sin of the world in the sense that he's fulfilling every jot and tittle that the law of God and his justice required against those sinners that he came to save. And so the sin bearer that is tied up with who he is as the lamb of God. Very specific. But also we see in this the characteristic of the lamb. Not just any lamb. If you look over in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 22, Robert read for us 1 Peter 1, where it speaks of us being redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb. He was foreordained. None of this is done haphazardly. It says there, who verily, in verse 19 of 1 Peter 1, going back to what Robert read, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He had to be the fulfillment of the type. And it says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That tells us right there that the fall was not a surprise to God. Even before there was the fall, there was the Savior that was ordained to save those that God purposed to save, but was manifest in these last times. Ever since Christ came in the flesh the first time, we have entered into the last times. John says we're in the last hour. We don't know how long that's going to be, but until that last one is brought to Christ for whom he paid the debt, time will continue. Now, I know a lot of times when we read this, we stop at, was manifest in these last times for you. And you notice there's a comma there. So just read, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God. Notice, who by him do believe. He wasn't manifest for every single person, but for you who by him do believe in God. In other words, for whom he paid the sin debt. He is that lamb slain and that was raised up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God and not in yourself. Again, the lamb is Christ fulfilled as a lamb, but in the characteristics of the lamb over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says in verse 21, for even hereunto are ye called. One calling is unto the lamb. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that he should follow his steps. When it says leaves us an example, it's an example in his suffering, how he suffered and died. There's no man that has ever suffered as he suffered as the substitute. But it says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You see how that answers to what was required even on the Passover lamb that it be observed, and not just any lamb be put up, but it be without spot and without blemish. So the characteristics of the lamb, very specific, just as the choice of the lamb, very specific. But then in the death of the lamb, it couldn't be death by stoning, it couldn't be death by hanging, or throwing off of a cliff. There were many times when Christ walked this earth that they sought to put him to death. Such was their spirit of Antichrist. But they were not going to put Christ, the Lamb, to death in any other way than what God himself had ordained. And that would be through the shedding of blood. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 9, every one of these verses could be a message. Just touching on the surface so we can see the significance. Anybody that took this for granted... <laughs> When God said, when I pass through that land where I don't see the blood, there will be condemnation. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no hope of salvation for any sinner. I don't care how comfortable they feel in their profession or about their works, because there are many of them out there that think that somehow God's going to save them because they've been a so-called good Christian all their lives. That's too long. 
Here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, notice, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, in the tabernacle in the Old Testament represent Christ in the flesh, but now not to be compared to who he is in his person, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Here's a reminder that all of these pictures of the lamb slain in the Old Testament were but types and pictures. They did not actually put away sin. The only blood shed of any lamb that has ever put away sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That tells us it wasn't obtained until he shed his blood. It was purposed. But all those sacrifices there in the Old Testament were awaiting. It was as if the, that's why the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures call it the atonement. It's a covering. Christ's death was not an atonement. It was a propitiation. It was a reconciliation. It was redemption, having obtained eternal redemption. It was justification by his blood, not before. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself. There we see the, the submissive nature of Christ as the lamb. He offered himself without spot. God himself had to approve that lamb right on up to the cross. He was under the scrutiny of men and enemies, but more so under the scrutiny of God the Father himself that everything about that righteous obedience be acceptable to a holy God. You want to try to match that? Well, how foolish people think we could begin. It says, through the eternal spirit, we have God the Father, we have God the Son, we have God the Spirit, all described here in this work of salvation. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living. The Spirit of God is pleased to reveal Christ the Lamb in our heart. This conscience, which in and of itself left to itself, would always think that there's something I have to do, but here it's called dead works. If there's anything in your thought and mind that thinks that somehow I've got to do something to answer to God's justice and holiness, well, to that degree, Christ has not been revealed in you. But if you're His, one for whom He paid the debt, I can guarantee you that the Spirit of God is going to so reveal Christ in you that your conscience be purged from dead works. That's what everything is apart from the work of Christ, is dead works to serve the living God. So there are many scriptures that we find in the New Testament as to the choice of the sacrifice. That's God's choice. That's his son. The characteristics of that lamb, the death of the lamb, but also we see even in the eating of the lamb that's described here. It wasn't to be eaten in just any haphazard way. It's like it's not in any way that we come to Christ. We come in the faith that the Spirit gives and we partake of Him. That's what eating is. In the way that God has so ordained. And the eating of the lamb represents that faith that rests in Christ's finished work. If you look in John chapter 6, John chapter 6 and verses 53 and 54, even our Lord spoke in these terms before his death. John chapter 6 and verse 53 and 54. Then Jesus said unto them, See, they're only thinking in fleshly terms up in verse 51. The Lord said, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, the life of those sinners throughout the world that he came to save. 
And the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're thinking that they were literally going to chew on his flesh. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. I'm not talking about physically eating his flesh or physically drinking his blood, but what it represents, because he explains it in verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. What's he talking about? He's talking about his death. That by partaking of him, we have life. Actually, it says there are any that do partake in verse 54 already have that eternal life. That's why they partake. But when people wonder, well, why is this such a big deal for you? I always talk about Christ and him crucified. Always. Isn't there anything else you can pray? Nope. This was foundational to Israel as a nation. And I'll tell you, it's foundational to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, back here in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord said that this would be their beginning. Verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Even today, the Jewish calendar starts somewhere in March and April, the time where they celebrate the Passover, and they, they continue to do that without ever thinking of what, what it means, what the purpose is. They go back to that as being their foundation as a nation, and being brought out of Egypt. Well, guess what? You ask me, well, What's the foundation of the church? What is that foundation which has been laid that no other foundation may be laid than what God has laid? That's in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the birth of our existence, that work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is why when we study the Passover as we're doing today as a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't escape the perils. In fact, if the Spirit of God teaches us, which I'm going to attempt to do to show some more of these parallels, we understand that this is all about Christ. And we don't need to doubt it. One other portion is over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. I don't know how it could be put any more plainly than what Paul does here in this portion. When he is talking about how worship was to be done without leaven, without mixture. It's just like the Passover week. It was a week without leavened bread. Christ is without leaven and without spot. So he says in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven. There's not room for the law and for the dead works, which we read there, plus Christ. It's Christ plus nothing. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened in ourselves, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Can't get it any plainer than that. Therefore let us keep the feast uh, we feast. The word feast means to partake. We feast on Christ, not with old leaven. Not part Christ and part whatever else we furnish. No, Christ alone. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's why we worship. One purpose, to glorify Christ. So if we come back here in the time remaining, just want to go down through here. And show you some more of these parallels, some of which I've already touched on. But the first is the lamb being without blemish. As it says there in verse 5, your lamb, doesn't say should be, as if there's an alternative here. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Now, in this particular scripture, you can see, tied it with verse 4, there was a particular lamb for every soul. Go up to verse 4. Let, let each house take it according to the number of the souls. 
There's some that believe that Christ died and shed his blood for an uncertain number. Now, I will tell you that everyone for whom he shed his blood, that blood was appointed. Just like here, none in their households was to be passed by. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. That's specific, isn't it? That shows God's purpose and design. There's not one left out in Christ's death that God did not purpose to save. It's not like it's just a general death and now we'll find out who will receive the benefit. No. But that it be, as it describes there in verse 5, a lamb without blemish and a male of the first year. That's pretty specific. I believe this here signifies the absolute perfection and sinlessness of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are some today that want to charge Christ with sin by saying, well, in order for him to be the Lamb of God, he had to take the sin of his people in him. They actually believe and preach that Christ was made a sinner there on the cross. If that were the case, then the sacrifice would be tainted, and it would have completely violated every type and picture of the Old Testament. When the priests, high priests, would lay their hands on these lambs before slaying them, that's a picture of imputation. Those lambs didn't actually become sinners, but it's a picture of God's justice being put over on the lamb to be slain, that those that he represents might be declared righteous. And so the picture is true from beginning to end, from conception all the way to the cross. It was necessary that Christ be that lamb without blemish and without spot. In order for him to be our righteousness, he had to live that perfect life. Not just in word, in deed, but in thought. Not just in the letter of the law, but the very spirit of it. This is where he came back against the Pharisees who thought themselves to be righteous before God based upon their obedience to the law. And the Lord went even down to the very core of the law by telling them, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, if you so much as say, raka, you're guilty of hellfire. Raka means you fool. We've, we've said that just off the cuff to anybody that does something that we don't think is right. You idiot, you fool. That in and of itself is a condemnation by the law and would make any one of us guilty. You think something like that? Absolutely. Because the law requires perfection. Go look at the life of Christ. Just like we read a little while ago in 1 Peter 2, when reviled, he reviled not again. Not this, just that he held his tongue, but in, in his spirit, he never reacted Never thought an evil thought against those that sought to kill him. That's perfection. You want to talk about a perfect man. That's who he is, it's Christ. But that was necessary in order to put away our sin. If that lamb in the Old Testament had any kind of spot or blemish, then it could not be offered. See, this is where the Pharisees in Christ's day, they diminished through what the sacrifices represented, they diminished the importance because when people would bring their lambs, they had some lambs in the back that they had taken away from other people that brought them and told them it was no good. And so they took those out of their hand, made them pay for another one. That's what the money changing was about in the temple. And then they'd take that lamb and swing it around back and put it in the flock for the next victim that would come along. I thought about this this week because I went to take some batteries to replace our webcams that are outside there. I took them to the battery shop and I handed them over, the used batteries, to the, the storekeeper and said I need to replace these and get some new ones. And he was joking, but it kind of caught my attention because as soon as I handed it to him, he said, okay, here you go. Handed me back the old ones. Slide of hand. And he was joking. He said, I'm just a kid. But I thought, you know, that's what these Pharisees did with the lambs that people brought. Tell them that one won't work. But as soon as the 
the people gave them over. They took them right back there and resold them. That's man's justice, not God's. And so it had to be a lamb without blemish in order to pay for our sin. And he had to have no sin in him. That sacrifice to be accepted had to be perfect. And even this is written clearly in the Old Testament. If you look at Leviticus chapter 22, and verse 21. Look at Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 21. It says, Whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow for a free will offering in beeves, that's the bovine, or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish there. Why do you suppose that's written? It's for Christ's sake. They might look at who this represented in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, coming back here to Exodus chapter 12, again, let's look at a second description. And that is, here it says in verse 5, Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Christ, the Lamb of God, and if he shed his blood for us, our Lamb, he was taken from among men. This is not something that was accomplished in heaven. It required him to come to this earth and to live among men. So imagine all of these other sheep and goats. That one sheep that was taken out by God to be that Passover lamb. And that would be sacrificed. Even in that designation. How do you know which one? Well... The Lord himself directed in the choice, but it was even as Christ from among men. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 15 through 19, you'll see this parallel here. Deuteronomy 18 and verses 15 through 19. It says, the Lord thy God, Moses speaking now to the people, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Stop and think about those for whom Christ paid the debt. Aren't they called sheep? But out of all of those sheep, in that fold, here God has chosen his lamb and taken him out from among them them, that he might be their representative. That's what I see here. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. That's what they understood to be their lot apart from a mediator whom Moses calls here that prophet like unto him that ye shall hearken to. In verse 17, the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. Here's a lamb from among all those other sheep, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command them. So we see specifically how Christ the Lamb was taken from among men. It wasn't just some general choice. There's a specific seed that was promised to Abraham, wasn't it? And the scriptures speak of the seed of the woman. They speak of the seed of David. That's all specific. All of time pointed to him being raised up from among men that he might be that Lamb of God. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 16, I know I'm turning to a lot of scriptures here, but they're all significant. In Galatians chapter 3, speaking of the seed of Abraham, it's not physical seed. It's not the Jewish nation. Yes, Christ was raised up from among that nation, but he was to be the Lamb of God that takes away, that bears away the sin of the world. In other words, sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue. But it was a specific seed, just like here, a specific lamb from among the fold. Now to Abraham, Galatians 3.16, and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 
even down to this, it had to be that specific lamb. Now it says also in Exodus chapter 12, a third characteristic, that the lamb was to be a year old. Notice that in verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. I don't know how years are measured in lamb's years. Someone was telling me the other day, they asked how old their cat was, and they said it was 77 years old. It's like, what? Well, they were obviously talking about cat years and not human years. But even here with our Lord Jesus Christ, the picture is that this lamb that was to be offered wasn't to be an old lamb. It wasn't to be that it was on its last leg anyway, and so let's go ahead and offer it. No. A lamb of a year old means that it is in its full strength. Christ didn't die because of a weakened condition, no matter what they did to him. He laid down his life, and he was put to death in the prime of his life. So it shows there that that even was with purpose, according to the will of God, that it should be in the prime of his life. The strong lamb. There's many pictures that come to mind here. The strength of the lamb. He didn't die because he finally expired after having been whipped and beaten. And they did to him what they did. No. Even his last cry, from the cross was with a loud voice he cried and said it is finished and then bowed and said that word bowed that's used there is pillow like you lay down at night to sleep he pillowed his head all the work was done and he commanded his spirit to the father but moving on down there's so much more here as to how the lamb was to be the bloodshed put on the doorposts God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That, that blood of the lamb that had to be sprinkled on the lintel, the sides of the doorposts, that, that shows how the blood is specifically applied. Now, it's not applied. Here again, people get it wrong. They say, well, I apply it. It's when, when I do it, and then that's when God passes by. No, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. If you read about this blood being put on the lentils of the door, as it says there, verse 7, they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. This was applied on the outside. This is where the blood was put. They, being inside, they couldn't see it. And I believe that's a perfect picture of our deliverance and our salvation. It's not when we see it that we've been delivered, but it's when God saw it, when he applied that blood. When did he apply the blood? When Christ died. We're justified by his blood. For years, I even had that wrong. I thought, well, the blood's been applied, but I'm still under the wrath of God until such time as I believe. And then when I believe, now God justifies. Well, that puts then the infectionless of the blood on my believing. And not on the shed. It's when God saw that blood shed that he was satisfied. That's what Romans 5 says. Being therefore now justified. How? By his blood. When I see it, it's the effect of it. God causes me to see it by his spirit because that blood has already been applied. And uh, God is satisfied. But then you see here, sixthly, I was to be eaten. And it says there, the lamb was to be roasted. You see that in verse 8? They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Each of those is representative, again, of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The roast with fire represents God's wrath being poured out upon the lamb as the substitute, Christ the substitute. With unleavened bread represents his perfection. Without leaven, that's, he's the bread of life, but no sin in him. And with bitter herbs, that describes the sufferings. Every time that they partook of the Passover, they're reminded of the suffering of the lamb on their behalf. And not one bone 
was to be broken. It wasn't. That's why when in John 19, when they came to Christ to ensure that he was dead, they found that he had already given up his spirit to the Father. The other two thieves on either side, they break the leg so they couldn't push up and get air. But for Christ, according to the scriptures, it said that no bone was to be broken. Such was what the law required. They couldn't even do to Christ anything but what had already been ordained. So it says there that they were to eat the flesh. It says in verse 8, they shall eat the flesh in that night. So it wasn't to be slain and then left over. Again, as we've already seen, eating that flesh represents that faith that God gives to partake of Christ. If God didn't give the faith, we'd never know the importance of his sacrifice. We wouldn't even know what to eat and how to eat. But when God by his spirit so teaches us, we partake. See, that's what that faith is, partaking of his flesh and his blood. And we do so by faith. Drinking his blood represents that faith, just like partaking of his flesh. Whenever we open this word, Here's a feast laid out for us, but we look for Christ. And to partake of his flesh and to drink of his blood is representative of believing on him in his person, just as he set forth in the word. And partaking of his blood is looking to that sacrifice as to what it should accomplish. And then they were to eat it with unleavened bread. It says there in verse 8, unleavened. Picture of of evil, if you will, of sin. That's to signify that even as we read there in 1 Peter chapter 2, we come to Christ in sincerity and truth. We don't come part with our works and faith and part with what Christ did. No, it's all of him. That's how we come. Without any, in sincerity and truth, sincerity means without wax. <laughs> the word seer, without wax. There's nothing when, when they'd make pots back in the day and uh, make them for holding water, if a pot cracked, they would often take wax and cover up the crack of the pot and look good until you got home and put it on the fire and all of a sudden the water comes flowing out. And sincerity means that we don't come with any cover. We come as we are as sinners. But we come in truth, in Christ who's the truth, believing that when he paid the debt, he paid the debt for sinners such as we are. So the lamb, even in how it was to be eaten, instruction is given very specifically. It's to be roast with fire, not boil. There are a lot of people today that say, well, it doesn't really matter how we partake of Christ, as long as we do it sincerely. That's not how it's set forth here. It isn't according to man's preference. Well, I prefer hearing Christ preach this way. I prefer understanding his death that way. Now, there's only one way, and that's God's way. And not to be eaten raw, half-cooked. There's nothing half-cooked about the death of Christ, where he, his blood was shed, but now when we partake, we finish the rest. Or sod and bowl with water. No. Roast with fire. That means in that we see the very justice of God being satisfied in his death. And it says there that nothing was to remain until the morning. That says that as the Lord is pleased to reveal himself in us, we partake of him immediately. I worry about people that tell me after hearing a message such as this, I'm going to go home and think about it. You're going to leave that for tomorrow? When it's clearly declared already how it is that God justifies sinners, I'm going to go... I want to consult my family and see what they think. I'm going to go talk to my pastor about it. All that dilly-dallying indicates that you've never come to Christ. Even though it might seem new and different to your soul, when we hear of him, as he's revealed here in the scripture, set forth in this specific way, those the Lord teaches, they bow. There's no hesitating to partake of him. Nothing was to remain until the morning to say, well, I'm going to take this part here that I like about Christ, but the rest I'm going to leave for later. Let me mull it. Nope. 
Christ in all of his offices as prophet, priest, and king. Christ in all of his person and work. They come together. There's no believing in part of him like they say, I'll believe him as Savior, but you can still not bow to him as Lord. That's picking and choosing. You sit down and see somebody, you, the meal's been prepared, and you find them begging out the parts they don't like and lay them over, and you ask, well, what are you going to do with that? I'll get that later. Well, the meal is a whole. The meal is prepared. And so it is with Christ. But as it says there, too, in verse 11, thus shall ye eat it. Your loins girt it, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. That's describing the urgency with which we partake of Christ. Give me Christ or I die. There's no hesitating when the Lord is pleased to reveal Christ in you. I remember having studied all this for years and thought I had some understanding of it until it pleased God to reveal Christ to me. And then suddenly now, there was an urgency. I had to go back and start reading this scripture and wonder how it is I miss Christ. Couldn't let it alone. And read through the scriptures multiple times. Again, looking for Christ. That's that haste. That urgency. Christ described it as those that take the kingdom of God by violence. It wasn't mean being violent people, but it means that such was the press. We've, some of us have lived in countries where rice became so scarce that when the truck would pull up with bags of rice on the back, there was a rush to get that rice, even trampling over others to get there. That's the urgency with which Christ describes those in whom he does the work, the haste that we see here. As he says, it is the Lord's Passover. And finally, there in verse 13, there's much more here, but the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's why it's called the Passover, the Passover and judgment. And this is why to this day, this ordinance is called the Passover because it was the Lord at the sight of the blood of the Lamb. He passed over the Israelites and delivered them. And his judgment and wrath passed over those that, for whom Christ has paid the debt. More than just the Passover, but the actual blood being shed and put away. That's what we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. So as we prepare to partake of the Lord's table. We don't partake of it as a Passover feast, but rather in memory of him who paid the debt. Here in Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of sins is directly tied to the redemption through his blood. I know this is difficult for any of us to perhaps get a hold of, but Christ isn't up in glory now waiting to forgive your sins if you'll just confess them. Now that forgiveness of sins was granted through his shed blood. That's where redemption took place. That's where reconciliation with God was accomplished. That's where justification was accomplished there at the cross. And so in partaking of the Lord's table, we do remember him in such a way. But let's take our hymn books before we Take the Lord's table and sing him number 192. 192, according to thy gracious word. 192. Let's stand and sing this. <laughs>
sight of all the mingling going on. Here's a man carrying some water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house. I don't believe the Lord would be calling any man a good man were it not that he were one of his for whom he came and paid the debt and who would have opened up his house to our Lord to partake of that Passover. And Say, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Because the Spirit of God is already at work in him. This was a no-brainer. That place had been prepared for this hour and this time. 
talk about a great privilege that all the way from the end of time to this particular time, this room, this place, had already been destined and ordained and should be at this time that the Lord would observe this final Passover. Because this would be the last one. Right? He says that with desire he longed to eat of this Passover with his disciples. Why? Because the fulfillment was near. He will show you a large upper room. I love this. Furnished and prepared. Whenever our eyes are open to see Christ and his death and his sacrifice, it is a room furnished and prepared and made ready for us. We don't do anything to add to it or take from it. His disciples went forth and came to the city and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. Everything that God ordains comes to pass exactly as he declares. And in the evening, he, he cometh with the twelve. Again, just like we saw, this Passover was to be slain and eaten in the evening. Nothing left over for the next day. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. I believe, as we read in other portions in John, that Judas partook of the Passover, just like many did in the Old Testament. But when it came down to the time to to partake of the new covenant, of the Lord's table, Judas excused himself. He went out to betray our Lord. But here, he's saying, one of you which eateth with me, he's talking about eating that Passover meal, shall betray him. Just like many ate of it and died and perished. Because there, there's no salvation in just the partaking of the, of the ceremony. They began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And you read that, another way of reading that is, is to put it in the sense of, It's not I, it's not me, is it, Lord? It's not me, could it be me? And he answered and said unto them, If is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. That was that sop that was there on the Passover table. Notice the Lord's table. We've got two elements. We've got the, the cup and we've got the bread. There's no bitter herbs. There's no sop. That was part of the Old Testament Passover where they would actually dip the lamb and they would moist and eat it. You say, where's the lamb for us? Well, he's slain. Now he's slain again. He said, as one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish, and the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. Though his betrayal by Judas was not a surprise. He goes as it is written of him. They didn't do one thing to our Lord who was ordained. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. How is the Son of Man betrayed even today by those that profess to know, by their works and by other ceremonies that they want to add or contribute to his work alone? Good work for that man if he had never been born. Why? Because there is an eternal condemnation for those outside of Christ. And as they did eat, so when you go over and read in the other Gospels, particularly John, you'll see that at this point, when Judas dipped that sop in, the bread in that sop, the meat, then Lord said, whatever thou doest, do quickly. He went out. Now there's a transition, verse 22, as they did eat. So they were eating, continue to eat the Passover lamb when now the Lord returns it. Jesus took the bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. This unleavened bread that we hold in our hands today is what the Lord has ordained for us to continue to celebrate his faith. He said, this is my body. It represents his body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for them. New Testament. Not according to the Old Testament with its types and pictures and prophecy, but the New Testament. 
in his blood, which is shed for many. As we partake of this cup and drink it, we remember the blood shed. It's the bread, the body of Christ, and his shed blood. Not one without the other. We took the perfect obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that blood shed to be our salvation, those for whom he died. He said, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After his resurrection, we find him eating and drinking, breaking the bread, partaking with those for whom he paid the debt. This isn't some sweet by and by. The kingdom of God was established in his death, in his resurrection. It says when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll partake. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word that is so clear and distinct. Thank you that today we observe your death, the death of your son, based on what we read here and not because of any tradition that has been passed down to us by men. But as we partake, may we be mindful that this unleavened bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was without sin. We have a body prepared that should be sacrificed unto you. And as we drink the cup, we remember his shed blood. For without it there is no remission, but in it there is all remission of sin, past, present, and future. So that when we look upon us, we see our sin no more. Oh, what a blessed truth that you see only the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on our behalf. So I pray that you would bless as we partake and in our hearts ever be on your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I ask this. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing one final hymn before we're dismissed. And I encourage everybody to remain. Kneel together afterward. Hymn number 475, Redeemed. How I love to proclaim, redeemed by the blood. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His shining forever I am. Jesus, the language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence will be done continually dwell. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the land. Redeem, redeem, his child forever. Blessed Redeemer, I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem. It's shining forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose I delight, who lovingly pardoned my footsteps and given me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and